Well, welcome everyone to Discovering Your Business's Value. We're excited to be here with you today. It's one of the questions that we get a lot here at CRI Capital Advisors. My name is Paul Evans and also from the CPA side, Mark Berry is going to be joining us today. We'll do introductions in just a minute. But this is the first question that we often get. What's my company worth? And there's a lot of guesswork out there. There are a lot of ways to try to determine that. But what we hope to do today is educate you on the exact process of getting an accurate measure of what your company might actually bring when you go to market. So we're going to be focusing on that today. So let's begin with our introductions. Let's start with Mark Berry. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us. I'm a, a partner in our transaction advisory services group. Uh, in this group, we perform buy side and sell side financial and tax diligence. Uh, to narrow that down on the sell side work, we work with business owners and management teams and their go to market process. And on the buy side, uh, our clients are usually institutional investors, investors or other strategic buyers um, that are executing on acquisitions. Uh, from an experience standpoint, I'm in my 18th year of, of transaction advisory services. Um, I'm also a business owner, have transacted on three separate businesses, businesses have exited two of those. Um, so I definitely understand personally what it is to wanting to understand business value. And my name is Paul Evans. I'll be your host, also facilitating this today. I'm one of the partners here at CRI Capital Advisors. So we're the mergers and acquisitions arm of Car Riggs and Ingram. Uh, I've been a business owner for the past 30 years. It's hard to imagine that it's been that long. A lot of different industries and companies and formed the company along with a partner that we merged into CRI back in 2010. Uh, love these industries that we get to work with, love business owners and helping them not only value their business, but actually take it to market. And the next two presenters also are very hands-on when it comes to marketing the business and getting the most for your money. Brendan? Thanks, Paul. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Brandon Maddox. I'm a partner with CRI Capital Advisors. I've uh, been doing this for about 10 years. And as Paul said, very much uh, in the day-to-day uh, -day nuts and bolts of process uh, when it comes to taking your company to market, packaging it up, um, getting you through diligence, um, really just in the weeds with, with all of those with each of our clients, but uh, excited to talk about this topic today. Excellent. And Joel Sykes. Hey, good morning, everyone. I'm Joel Sykes. I'm partner and managing director with CRI Capital Advisors. I've been supporting M&A transactions for about 16 years now, 13 of those with Car Riggs and Ingram Capital Advisors. Uh, before that, I served as a financial consultant and CFO, part-time CFO, interim CFO, and sometimes full-time CFO for small, closely held companies. Uh, come from a entrepreneurial background. My father owned his own business. I worked with him for several years and ultimately helped him sell that business. So talk about a tough client, helping your dad sell the business. So happy to be here today and uh, looking forward to the discussion. Great. And what we're going to be covering is the true worth of your company. That'll be very brief. We're going to look at the process for discovering your value, the five elements of discovering that, that'll be a lot of details there, and the seven pivotal drivers of value. And then if we have time, we're going to do some Q&A. If there's not time, we'll certainly follow up after this event and share our uh, insights and hopefully advice with you personally after everything is over. So the true worth of your company, it actually comes down to what somebody would actually pay, right? That's the core element. And the question is, how do we determine what someone might bring to the table? And what we call that here is a market assessment. It's basically saying that this number is going to give you an accurate view that if you go to market in today's economy with the multiples that are in play, most likely these are the numbers that you're going to hear the most. Now, ultimately, what somebody will pay you for your company is its true worth. This is going to be an accurate number so that you can set your expectation correctly and know that if somebody comes and makes an offer, if it's even close to what you should be receiving. So there is five elements that we really want to focus on right out of the gate to solidify this process, to get to the number that we're really trying to reach. It'd be great if it was as simple as just looking at your net income and then figuring out something from there, but there are a lot of different elements in play. Uh, number one is the market mission, knowing 
how you want to sell your company and knowing why you want to sell your company. So when you're thinking about how you're going to sell your company, being able to focus on that and really understand the options available can make a difference. So Joel, uh, what are some of the ways that a person could sell their company and what needs to be in their mind? Yeah, you know, it's a great question and it's easy for us to say, hey, a broad auction, maximum exposure is always going to be the right avenue to sell your company. Oftentimes, that type of process does drive absolute maximum value. You've got every type of buyer. You've got a large list of potential acquirers at the table, uh, but there is an exposure element with that. Um, you may have a different outcome in mind. You may be really concerned about uh, family members in the business who are going to continue beyond your exit or the management team that you would like to see supported after you eventually exit um, exit the business. So that could lean more toward a family office transaction that has a longer hold period and they're much more likely to keep the, the full team intact. So a lot of different ways to approach how you sell a business. Um, it's it's never just a cookie cutter approach. Part of what we do, especially in this assessment phase, is really hear our client um, talk about what their maximum their their maximum outcome, their ultimate goal is, and then we craft a process toward that. You know, being able to have those pieces in mind and in place really really help us determine what's this end result going to look like. But not only that, you want to know why you want to sell your company, not simply. It's time. That could be one of the answers, but there could be a lot of reasons why. Brandon, what are some of the different options and why is this even important? Yeah, I mean, knowing why is critical. Um, it's a long process to sell your company, not an easy thing to go through. Anybody that's been around it or done it before knows that it's not just a handshake, typically. Um, so knowing why, um, you know, is it a is it a life change you're trying to to implement? You know, you maybe you've reached retirement and you're and you're looking to move on to what's next. Maybe you're just tired of doing it by yourself. A lot of business owners we talk to, they feel that burden day in and day out of oh, wow, this thing is completely on me. Whether that's from a financial or an operational standpoint, so maybe they've reached some inflection point in their life and they're saying, okay, I'm tired of doing it by myself. I want to bring on a partner. I want to bring on somebody to help me. Maybe to help me to do things I've never been able to do. Maybe I've we had a client a few years ago who you know wanted to go into different markets he wasn't comfortable doing that by himself so he was able we were able to bring a partner to the table for him and they're you know in way more markets than what he could have ever dreamed of doing but he knew that why he knew what was driving him to come to the table to go through the process to execute a transaction that why is critical to making it to the end yeah and both of these can actually impact your value because of the type of buyer that you're entertaining uh, if they know that you're really looking to exit completely, that's one type of buyer and can change the multiple. Uh, also, if you're looking to stay on and be an operator, that can be another number. So how and why really do make a difference? So this is a, a simple, maybe even elementary sentence, but I'm looking to sell X percentage of my company because I'm looking forward to blank. It could be I want to sell 70% of my company because I'm really looking forward to gaining a partner and gaining extra capital and resources to triple this business over the next five years. Or I'm looking forward to selling 100% of the company because I'm ready to retire. So there's a lot of different options. A red flag is having the attitude completely of, I, ju I just don't have to sell. Now, it's a great position to be in, not having to, not being forced to, but at the same time, a buyer doesn't really like to entertain someone who is like, I, this is all up in the air and it's just optional. And unless I get X, Y, and Z, I'm just not even going to do it. That makes your company a little bit harder to value. But if you're truly interested in selling, it can end up making a difference to the bottom line. Number two is the market multipliers. So this could be deals that are similar and also something called a NACE code, which allows us to really drill down in the marketplace. Um, Mark, you, you deal with a lot of buyers, sellers as well, but on the buy side, let's take manufacturing, for example. It, aren't all manufacturers just manufacturers and they're all work the same? What, why is it even important to drill down? Yeah, no, that's it's a great question. Uh, one we get asked frequently, um, you know, from I'll, I'll try to answer this quickly in two parts, uh, Paul. So to answer your first, your, the question you proposed, um, you know, is manufacturing all the same? It's absolutely not. Um, some manufacturing companies own their intellectual property, right? They have some sort of patent on a specific product that 
allows them um, to drive value, right? They have more value than someone that maybe is uh, doesn't own their their IP or their intellectual property. Um, but into that same thing, um, just understanding your business, understanding your industry to know what the KPIs, what are the key performance indicators uh, and being able to compare yourself or your business to your competitors that are that have been in the market, right? A software company, what's your MRR? What's your monthly recurring revenue or your annual recurring revenue? What's your customer retention? That's completely different than what we just talked about with, with manufacturing. So understanding your industry, your market, and how how buyers are are really looking at that industry specifically uh, with KPIs and, and whatnot allows you to really understand how the go-to-market process is going to work. Yeah, because if we're, if we're not able to really drill down and, and understand it the way that you're talking about, we could hear any number out there in the marketplace. And I'm sure that you've experienced this where somebody might say, I know somebody got 16x for their company, but their company was a lot larger and their company was completely in a different industry. And so what Mark's talking about is that we need to, to understand not only what industry you're in, but also narrow it as much as possible within that industry so that we can be accurate. Uh, the third thing that we look at is market activity. How much is actually taking place in the market at this time? So Joel, what are some of the things that you consider and you look at when you're looking at valuing a business and how it relates to market activity? Yeah, this is just another part of making a well-informed decision, helping the client make a well-informed decision. We have some tools. PitchBook is one of those. We can see transactions that have been done, are being done. Um, we can see the trends. Um, you know, is is the market for this type of company up or down compared to prior years? We can also see the groups that are acquiring these companies. So. Sometimes it's interesting to talk with a client who maybe they have a, a bad perception of private equity groups. Um, and, and, you know, there are great private equity groups and there are some that maybe are not so great. And we help sift through all of that. But but a client may say, hey, I, I had a friend who had a bad experience with private equity. I just I just don't want a private equity acquirer at the table. We're able to see, well, hey, you know, in your specific industry sector, about 70% of the transactions over the last, you know, three to five years have been private equity. So you, you may, without being aware, eliminate a large pool of buyers um, just based on some misinformation. Um, so what we can do is we can use some of these tools to see, one, are companies like yours actively being acquired? And then we can see behind the curtain a bit. Who is acquiring them? In some cases, we can see what they're being acquired for. It's a little harder to see the private company transactions, but the the transactions that are made public, we can glean some information from those that are relevant to the smaller privately held companies. But it's just a few more data points around this decision that help us help the client make an informed decision about the level of activity in a very specific market space. So help from the standpoint of really realizing how much activity is in play, because if there's low activity, a red flag, and if there's no activity, it's a real red, red flag. Brandon and I were talking to a uh, business owner yesterday, and they were talking about six different groups that had come to the table uh, interested in their company. And that's something to consider as well. If you're getting a lot of knocks on your door as a business owner, and there's a lot of interest that can move the multiple. It can move the value of your company because when there's a lot of activity and there's a lot of demand for your industry, that's a positive. If there's no demand, then obviously it's going to be a challenge getting a higher multiple at that time. I say that's number three, market activity. Number four is market sounding. This is something that is really helpful to understand from the standpoint of contacting buyers in the space. And if you are able to do that to help gauge the value of your company, it's a great exercise where you're calling actual buyers and determining what they're finding as, as valuable within your industry. Now, Brandon on our team does this a lot, reaching out to buyers, determining what they see valuable. And so, Brandon, what are some of the things that you hear? What are some of the things that you might be asking and listening for? Yeah, and as you mentioned early on, Paul, um, you know, the true worth of your company is going to be what somebody will pay. So a really great way to gauge that 
you know, we can run the calculations and we do those things in the assessment. But part of what informs that is, okay, let's talk to the people who are actually buying companies. So let's say you own a manufacturer and they're in a specific industry. Okay, well, we're going to talk to people who are buying companies in that industry, you know, recent activity, recent transactions. And we're going to ask them, okay, what kind of things are you looking for? What, uh, you know, what are red flags for you? You know, okay, if you see a company that has this quality or doesn't have this quality? Is that a is that something that will increase value? Is that something that will decrease value? So we try to fill them out and we try to understand, okay, how are they going to look at this? You know, we're going to present a company in a certain way and we're going to present it in the best light possible. But we want to know before we even go to market, how are buyers, how are active buyers actually buying today? What are they looking at? What are the things that drive them to either move closer towards a company and increase value or maybe back off and say, okay, no, that's really a risk factor. I really don't think I can step into that market. And some think, sometimes it's not things that are apparent. Sometimes there may be little small nuances and things. Okay. You're like, well, I thought that was a positive. I thought, you know, I thought whatever this add on I did or whatever this new product or new customer I had, I thought that was going to be a really positive thing. Well, term, sometimes we find out to a buyer that's actually a negative thing. Um, so having those informed conversations with people who are actually investing in a particular market is really critical to understanding a true value of a company. One of the red flags that we hear, and Brandon, define this for us. Sometimes we'll talk to someone, even during market sounding, and they'll make it really clear that they're a value buyer. What's that mean? Yeah, value buyer is is code for I want to pay as little as possible. Um, and and we I hear less of that than I used to because they've. I guess, I mean, not that it was a secret before what that meant. It seems pretty apparent, but I've heard less of that recently. Um, but we had groups who would just flat out say, yeah, we, we come in and we try to, we try to, you know, buy on value. Okay. Well, that, that means you're going to pay the smallest amount possible, which completely goes against the entire thing we're trying to do. We, we want to go to the market. We want to go strong and we want to make sure that we're maximizing value. But just on the other side of that, the buyers are like, well, you know, what ways can I pick apart value? And that, that is part of what that market sounding um, conversation informs as well. We can know the things they're going to pick apart and we can try to you know, either shore those things up ahead of time or find, you know, explanations for those that, that maybe put those in a little bit better light. Yeah. As you're trying to work through some of these steps that you're learning about today, if you're doing some market sounding for your own company, learn some of those language pieces, some of that vocabulary, because value, if you're thinking, I want to sell for maximum value and someone says, I'm a value buyer, you may start thinking, oh, they're fair. They're paying the fair market price and beyond. But as Brandon's talking about, they're looking for that discount and to buy for it as little as possible. And then number five is market drivers. And there are actually seven of these. So it's a pretty good bit. Even though there are these five elements to really discovering value, this one involves seven total drivers that you want to be monitoring on a consistent basis. Uh, acquirers are assessing these as they look at your company. It's going to determine value and worth. So you certainly want to improve those if there's some areas for improvement. And then you also want to be prepared with these seven because you want to be ready to sell in a moment. Uh, a lot of owners will say, I'm not, not even ready, not ready to go to market. But if the number's right, then I would be interested in selling. Well, the number gets right when you're really focused on these seven so that you're ready at any time. And it's not simply that you want to sell, but you're actually ready to sell. So we're going to step through these seven pivotal drivers of value. And it begins with defendable financials, which is adjusted earnings and EBITDA. I'm going to have Mark Berry in just a second define that. Uh, they're going to recast these financials in the buyer's lens. And really what we want to focus on, and this is Mark's area of expertise, a quality of earnings. So, Mark, what's it really mean to have defendable financials? Yeah, so um, I'm going to start by probably just giving a high overview real quick on what really a financial diligence or quality of earnings means. And really, it's... Um, it's really used uh, in the go-to-market strategy or in an acquisition to uh, analyze the company's financial statements and present them in a manner that really is easily digestible uh, by the reader, right? The main, main uh, analysis in a financial diligence report is a quality of earnings, 
which is trying to normalize what the free cash flow of that business is. And it's typically presented as adjusted EBITDA, Paul, like you mentioned, or pro forma EBITDA, which is how most businesses uh, are valued. Um, just I'll expound a little bit more here. Um, yesterday, I was on a call actually with a potential seller. Um, and a question came up, which is the, the first question I get a lot of times when I'm working with business owners, which is why would I invest in a quality of earnings when I know the buyer is going to have their team perform one, right? And my response is, I use different words every time, but the message is really the same, which is, you know, as a seller, why wouldn't you want to be the first one to the table with the number that you're expecting, right? Or that's been analyzed. And you're the first one at the table with that, that number to a reader or to a suitor or a buyer. Um, gives you the opportunity to, to lay it out there and provide your story in the way that uh, best puts your company at light. Um, you know, in, in, uh, to expound, Paul, on your, your buyer's lens, you know, we get the opportunity to work a lot with buyers um, in, in their transaction as they, they look to acquire companies. So we work frequently with them. We get we learn how they think about your industry or specific industry. Um, and we we really get to work and understand how they are looking at the business, right? From a buyer's mentality. Um, maybe they're looking at it, your specific industry as a roll-up opportunity. It's very fragmented, a lot of individual business owners, a lot of individual businesses that have small market share. So they want to take your industry and acquire these businesses and roll them up to create value and, and make it somewhat bigger, right? Um, maybe they also have al already have uh, in their portfolio some, some companies that would be your customers. So they're able to cross sell, right? They're able to build some sort of horizontal platform and perform some sort of horizontal integration, which overall adds value to their portfolio. Um, and then, you know, lastly, and the slide that you're presenting here, Paul, is you know, this is a quality of earnings presentation, which is where as a sell side diligence provider, we're scrubbing the financials to try to find maybe non-normal um, expenses, as an example, right? Maybe it's owner compensation is excessive. Maybe owner compensation is not what market should be, right? Maybe you have a new customer that you just signed a contract with and you need to then say, hey, what's the next 12 months worth of profit going to be when this com customer comes on board? Maybe you lost a supplier. And so now you need to go out and, and you don't have the, the right purchasing power. And so maybe it's, it's a negative impact. But overall, the purpose is to try to present your financials in a way that a buyer would understand what's the, what can I expect EBITDA to be or free cash flow to be once I own the business. And when it, it comes down to it really being defendable, not only are you the first one at the table, like Mark was saying, it also helps representatives like us to be able to go in knowing the numbers, knowing the numbers from the perspective of the buyer, not simply from our side or from the CPA side even, because we are looking through that different lens and we want to make sure that when we're asked questions, because we would be representing you, that we have everything, that we are so clear and can answer so definitively and knowing, all right, this is the true number. The quality of earnings really helps us get there. The second element, our second driver that we really want to look at is your key players. So those who are actually at the top of the company, the ones that are active every single day in the company, it makes a big difference. So Brandon, you work with a lot of groups that are not coming in to buy 100% necessarily. They might be doing 80% or 70%. And they're really looking toward these key players. But why is that even important to them? Yeah, most of the groups we work with, um, with some exceptions, are going to be purely financial buyers. Um, they have no interest in being an operator. They don't want to come in and and get in the weeds of running a company day to day. They certainly want to understand what's going on, but they don't want to have to come in and fill a key role like a, a CFO, a CEO, or a COO, any of those, um, you know, 
top management people and even the people who are, you know, maybe under that, maybe a second tier of management, but are the really the key players, the people who if something happened to them and no one was there to fill that role, there would be a huge hole and there would be something that immediately that that financial buyer would have to come in and fill. Uh, so it's a big deal for them. And it really speaks to risk on their side. They want to come in and see, OK, yeah, not only are have the owners driven the company in a way that, you know, sets it up for a new owner to come in and, and be able to take over and continue to have success. But they want to see that things have been set up in such a way, in a thoughtful way to say, OK, yeah, there is a second tier of management. It's not just all on the owners. And there are those second and third tier players who really are committed to the company long term, who really have the vision, who really want to see things succeed. Um, that just helps alleviate a lot of that risk, a lot of that anxiety for a buyer. And as a result, is going to drive up value. Anytime they see risk, value is going down. And the opposite is true as well. So a, a, a strong management team, not just that first tier, but even a tier below that, any of those key players who are just really, really, um, you know, the, the people who are driving the business, having a strong team there is going to go a long way to driving value. Let's jump into like an actual deal for a second. We hear from a lot of owners concern about their employees and is there a way to protect their position? You're talking about risk here that somebody didn't come in and just clean slate. What are some of the things that can actually be done to to ensure that as long as there's good behavior on the on the part of the key management team, what are some things that are usually done to ensure those positions? Yeah, I'll answer that. But you do bring up a great point. Um, you know, we, we've heard it time and time again. You know, there's that cliche about a private equity group coming in and buying a company. And there are bad actors out there. I'm not pretending they're not. But vast majority of the groups we work with, they're not coming in to fire anybody. In fact, they want just the opposite. They don't want anything to change. Now, they may find, you know, six months down the road, OK, this person needs to be moved to this position or maybe this person is not performing, as Paul mentioned. But they they really are incentivized and want to incentivize those key players to stay. So in the past, we've seen things like, you know, equity pools being set aside um, for those key players. Maybe they earn, you know, ownership over time. Maybe there's an incentive pool of a different kind that's set aside. They really want to do everything they can to keep the people who are driving and running the company today. They want to keep those people on board because when a private equity comes in and they buy a company, they don't want to go down. They don't want to see any downturns. They're not building a downturn into their model or else they wouldn't be purchasing the company. They want to stay right where you're at and grow from there. And a key way to do that, especially in this market, any business owner, you guys know it's tough to find people. Um, people are a huge deal uh, to run in a company and they're not just, you know, everywhere you look, you can't find somebody who really wants to work. So if you've got those key players already there, they're going to want to incentivize those people to stay. Yeah, they're the ones who really give has given the company a lot of its worth. Uh, if they've been there long term, there's a lot of stability, uh, so many advantages to that. And it's obvious why it's a driver. Number three, your concentration levels. Uh, what's your customer concentration, your suppliers, your vendors? Uh, Joel, what role does this play and what are some of the percentages we might want to shoot for? Yeah, I think this matter of concentration is really a matter of risk from the acquirer's perspective and, and risk. It is a value is a function of risk. So acquirers have to look at a company from the perspective of, you know, our intent is to acquire this company, invest in this company, really supercharge it and grow it so that it's worth a lot more one day. But they do also have to consider the downside. And this is where some of the concentration risks can come into play. So generally on the customer side, when an acquirer looks at a company's customer base, if one customer begins to approach that 15% of sales mark, that can potentially become a red flag. Um, you know, we've seen in the past, sometimes companies have one or two really primo clients and our customers, and they've been great customers. Uh, they're profitable customers, but that's an awful lot of sales in one or two buckets. And it could be a great company like a, a Boeing or a Walmart. Um, and, and that's that's great. Those are the kinds of marquee customers that can add to value. But if your only customer is a Walmart or a Boeing, not that there's anything particularly wrong with either one of those companies, if they represent the majority of your sales, and that's just 
a risk that an acquirer may have some hesitation over. Obviously, if that account were to ever go away, if you were to have a quality or a delivery issue with that customer and it were diminished somehow, well, there goes a big portion of the business. A challenge for closely held companies, independently owned companies is just how do I turn away revenue? You know, when I have, you know, customer A is, is a fantastic customer. They really, you know, 20 years ago, they really helped me get this business off the ground and I wouldn't really even be here without customer A and they just keep sending orders and now they're 60% of my total sales. How do I, how do I turn away from that revenue? And, and it's really difficult. It requires some tough decision-making sometimes, some extreme discipline. On the plus side though, let that be a motivator to you. And if you have a sales force, motivator for your sales force to say, hey, this is an incredibly profitable account. We, we've got to dilute it as a percentage of overall sales, which means raising overall sales. So you start to think about things like sales tactics, incentive programs, um, concerted, targeted effort to attract other customers that don't diminish that major player in your revenue portfolio, but that do help sort of offset and dilute it a little bit as a percentage of overall sales. On the supplier side, I think the... COVID-19 pandemic really brought the supply chain into super sharp focus, even for much smaller companies. A lot of times, small companies, I think prior to the pandemic, not a lot of closely held companies gave a lot of thought to the global supply chain because, you know, a, a small company can sometimes function more regionally. They have regional and even local suppliers that they rely on well down to the smallest degree, the supply chain was upset during the pandemic. And so we saw, um, you know, small and medium sized companies really having trouble sometimes getting the materials and the components they needed to, to, to deliver their products. So again, if you have a single source for a critical component, this is something you need to think about. And um, it, if, if the sources are limited, then you know maybe you buy a, a special uh, metal alloy uh, for your precision manufacturing business, and it's it's something that you just can't get off the shelf at your average you know metal uh, distributor. Um, think about an agreement with the one or two suppliers that do provide that, and um, think about you know well yeah. There is a concentration there, but they, that supplier has agreed to stock a certain amount of that for me. It's always available. I always have a three to six month cushion on my shelf and an additional three to six months on their shelf. So that's how I've addressed that concentration issue. So sometimes a, a concentration issue can't be eliminated, but it can be addressed and mitigated with just some, some planning ahead. Doing that in advance of going to the market can often add some lift to the valuation that, that the seller can expect. It's a lot of, a lot of movement, a lot of pieces in that to think, think about it. And when our companies are doing well, it's pretty easy to just keep doing what we're doing, but it's Joel mentioned COVID really upset that a pretty good bit, especially any of you who were dependent on logistics for your operations, you notice that upset. And so now's the perfect time to make sure that everything's in place so that when a time comes up, something that is disruptive or chaotic, that there's that possibility. And Joel, sometimes we will have an owner who will say, Yes, you know, this client is 75% of my business, but they've been with me 25 years and they are not going anywhere. This this is completely safe. How does a buyer look at that? Yeah, I still think there's a risk there. The longevity is good. And um, there's there's some acknowledgement that, great, you you have had that account for 20 or 25 years. But if there's nothing particularly bonding, nothing particularly formal about that relationship. If you've got a 10 or 20 or 30 year customer and it's still just totally PO driven, you know, they can order something today or they can, they can place a big order this month or not. Um, that's still um, a bit of a risk for an acquirer. So there are ways to create some elements of recurring revenue. Um, you know, when we hear recurring revenue, um, everyone's not everyone, so I can't speak for everyone, but most of the time the thinking goes to, okay, well, you're talking about a subscription-based 
revenue model or you're talking about a customer who will sign a multi-year contract with definite quantities and definite delivery dates that's just not how my business works and and those are ideal customers those those customers do help deliver premium value for a company but just um you know sort of being a little more inside your customer's organization if you're on their ERP platform so that you can see their production planning and you're in close contact with them and helping them, hey, we're going to, here's how you need to order from me to meet your production goals for the next 12 to 18 months. Even that's a step above just maybe they'll order this month, maybe they won't. So um, you want to think in advance about if, if you can't get a customer under contract for a definite quantity and a definite purchase date, which, which wow, that's that's hard to do. That's kind of the holy grail. But there are some things you can do to stabilize and solidify that relationship and sort of take some of the risk out of that for a potential acquirer. Excellent. Good insight, because it's pretty easy to feel confident if you've had a lot of years, but you do want to make sure that's as stable as possible. Number four is owner dependence. How dependent is the company on you? What are you doing that nobody else is? So Mark, again, working from the buy side of a deal the acquirers, when they're looking at the owner, what are they thinking about that they can step away from a day to, for a day, for a week? Or, or what are some of the areas that an owner is involved where he may be too involved or she may be too involved in the company? Yeah. <clears throat> so I'm going to try to give you a, just a real life example, Paul, to that, to that question. So at the beginning, I talked about, I, I own uh, an operating business and my business partner is, he's in the business day to day, day in, day out, right? He is the, the kingpin of that, that business, uh, whether it be uh, variance on sales, some sort of pricing variance, he has to approve it. Whether it be payroll, he's reviewing all the payroll reports, whether it be payables he's reviewing the payables who's going to get paid who's going to when and you know as we know as i know we're going to transact on this business hopefully in the next five to seven years we're slowly i'm slowly trying to teach him how to maybe delegate some of that work because at the end of the day i know his goal is to retire when he when we transact on this business he wants to be done right and so as we're slowly training him without him knowing uh we're talking to him about, hey, this opportunity comes, why don't we have the second in command make some of those decisions? Can you train him on how to make those decisions? On payables, can we train our controller on how to make, think of cash flow and can we work through that? That way, when we go to transact, the all decisions don't stop with the business owner, right? And so, so with that analogy or with that real life example, the, the short answer is the more that we can push down, the more that we have other fingers or other people making decisions or have the knowledge on how to make those decisions, it soothes a suitor or a buyer in our in my view. It gives them comfort that that business can run and can grow and continue to do those things because there's multiple people that know how to do almost every aspect of the business and operations. Yeah, that's so critical to be able to to be separate from the company somewhat and to realize the owner's role, how much is it related to revenue and how much is it related to something very replaceable? So if the owner is doing a lot of bookkeeping, it may not be great that that he's doing that, but it could be that someone could come in and learn that fairly rapidly. However, let's say that the owner is the key salesperson and she is driving every single one of the sales and revenue and there's no other people in the company that do sales. That is a critical element where somebody really needs to get in there and get trained because the revenue of the company is very dependent on this one person. So be thinking about how dependent the company is on you. And number five is recurring revenue. Joel mentioned this a, a little bit ago. Brendan's going to talk this a little bit further about understanding what recurring revenue is, how it differs somewhat from simply repeat business. And Brendan, why do acquirers like this component? Yeah, an acquirer loves recurring revenue because it's predictable. Um, so when we think about recurring revenue, we talk about this think about contracts. Think about something that someone on paper can say, okay, yeah, you've got customer A 
and they're spending X with you now, but what does that look like for the next couple of years? Okay, well, if I've got a contract that says, okay, they are bound to X amount per month or X amount per year, and I can bank on that, that's going to go a long way to making that buyer more comfortable. So recurring revenue, as, as Paul said, it's not just it's just not revenue or customers that keep coming back, which is great. You want the customers that keep coming back. That means you're providing a great product, a great service. Um, that's a really good thing. But, but to the extent that it's possible, if you can have those turn or move more towards a contractual relationship under which there it's easy to predict because there again, get in the mind of a buyer. A buyer is going to come in. They're going to look at your financials. They're going to look at your operations. They're going to look at your whole organization, and then they're going to build a model. They're going to say, okay, hey, under our ownership, what does this company look like? And yeah, they're going to look at the past. They're going to look at the financial reports. They're going to see what you've been able to do. But if they can look out into the future and they can say, okay, yeah, past revenue, that's great. That tells us what's happened. But if I can look in the future and I can say, what's future revenue look like? And so the extent that that revenue is contractual and they can say, okay, I have a piece of paper that says X amount of this company's revenue, I don't have to go out and find again. That doesn't mean something can't happen. You know, things happen, customers go away, the need changes. But if there's something on paper that makes them feel a little bit better. Okay. Yeah. I can bank on that amount, that percent of revenue there again, that's going to increase their overall comfort, which it normally is going to increase their overall value of a company because it's not something they're having to go in and try to figure out on their own. You've already figured that out through making that revenue more recurring uh, than just repeat, uh, like Paul was saying. Uh, I think we're seeing this pattern over and over and over again. Predictability and risk. These are two factors that acquirers are looking at constantly. And you, if you're deciding to buy a business, it'd be the exact same lens that you would be looking through as well. The other aspect that we want to look at is number six, systems and operations. So, Mark, aren't buyers just going to come in and do what they want to do? Do they really care what systems you have in place or if you've got an operation manual? How does this even make a difference? Yeah, no, I, they definitely care uh, about all of that um, is the short answer. But I think from a from a business owner standpoint, ideally, if you if you can take time and you can plan your go to market strategy, right, and really a few years in advance, there are a few questions that you really have to ask yourself, right? Am I collecting the right amount of data, and I am I gathering the right amount of data to assist in both the buy side and the sell side work? But more importantly, to be able to show someone um, how our operations really are doing. Right. So things to think about, am I using the best and most common accounting software system for my industry? If not, maybe I need to think about doing that. Um, is our revenue recognition policy the same as our competitors and how um, our industry does it? What about cost tracking? Uh, KPIs, am I creating, do I have the data on a daily, weekly or monthly dashboard? Am I tracking the metrics that are going to be important to a buyer? Again, eliminating risk, giving comfort to a, a buyer to, to see data. Um, do I have, if I'm a manufacturer, do I have capacity constraints? If so, what, what do I need to do to, to, uh, to break those capacity constraints so I can help grow, so I can grow, right? Or so the new owner can grow. Um, we talked a little bit about sales, right? Joel talked about sales with helping dilute customer concentration, right? Do I have a sales team? Do I have the right CRM to help them be productive and to help grow our top line you know, revenue? Those are all things that buyers as they come in and those are questions that they ask. And so it's always good if you have a couple of years to prepare for that, you can start documenting and start gathering all that information. So that way you can show good trends and be really prepared when you decide to go to market. Yeah, as some of these steps are so simple, but if we've run our business for years and it's worked real well for us, it's sometimes hard to get that that focus on getting things done. There are some companies out there that really have, like you mentioned, very inefficient CRM, some large companies that don't even have a CRM that you can really dive into and get a lot of reporting from. So this is a, a step that you want to consider. You don't necessarily have to just blow the doors off of this, but you do need to be wise so that your information, your KPIs are very easy to access. 
And then number seven, the seventh driver is growth and vision. So Joel, we, we just came out of a period where some businesses had really some of their worst years ever. And others had these incredible years. Like they they went from say five EBITDA to 25 EBITDA. So shouldn't they sell there at the 25 now that they've had this big jump? What does growth look like to a buyer and what's important? Yeah, this is where sometimes um, seller expectations can get, um, quite honestly, just sort of misaligned. So um, we did see, especially through the recent COVID pandemic, we saw some companies really take it on the chin and really struggle. We saw others just go through the roof. Um, and, and some acquirers do come and they say, hey, I know if I look back over the last five years, I had two million 3 million, 4 million profit, but man, in 2021, I had 15 million in profit and my, the industry multiple is six. So I'm worth $90 million now, right? And the math is not quite that straightforward. Uh, what we often hear and, and we advocate for sellers, so we don't just take buyers at, at face always, but what we hear from buyers is, hey, that hockey stick is hard to underwrite. And, and what they mean is um, you know, professional acquirers are generally investing other people's money and they may also be borrowing money. So can, can I sell that to the bank? You know, so in a, in a $50 million transaction, they may bring, you know, $60 million of equity to the table and maybe they're going to borrow $40 million from a lender. Can they convince the bank, hey, this... This big hockey stick, this this upswing in revenue is real, is sustainable. Yes, it's there. And it can be a tough case to make. Now, what we're seeing as we become further and further removed from the COVID pandemic is there were some companies that just really captured an opportunity there. And, and you need to be able to articulate that as a business owner. If you saw that big step up, you know, if you went from say 2 million in EBITDA to 6 or 8 million in EBITDA post COVID, but then 2023 and, and now projected 2024 look to be similar. Well, now you've got a case to make, right? It's not a one-off. It's beginning to prove itself out as a potential trend. We need to be able to help you explain why that's sustainable. So rather than just, Hey, um, I was just in the right place at the right time. Let's, let's get a better story around that. Hey, I took the opportunity while some of my competitors reduced staff and let go of some of their best salespeople. I hired those people and I was just in a better position to, to sustain the pandemic. So I hired three extra salespeople. We penetrated a, a new geographic market and I added two different products to our product line and, and then show here's the revenue that those efforts added. So rather than just sort of woohoo i'm worth a lot more now uh, could be the case but it is hard to underwrite that and there does need to be a more sustainable story behind that and speaking of narratives and stories not just on the growth side but it's important too in some cases not 100 percent of the cases but more often than not to have that vision for the future that is accurate so brandon what are some of the the things that owners can be thinking about to paint a great future, a realistic future for buyers? Yeah. Uh, a lot of times we talk to um, to sellers, uh, to business owners, and they, they're they just focused on, I'm ready to get out. When, when can someone bring me the, the, the sack of money and I want to, I want to head out to the beach and be done. Uh, okay. You can, you can do that. You can sell your company in that, in that way. You're likely not to get maximum value uh, because think again, from the, from the buyer's perspective, we just talked about growth. That's their number one thing. They want to grow because they're, they want to buy you. They want to grow it because they're looking to get returns. They're looking to, for this money that's been entrusted to them, they want to get a good return on that money. Uh, and they're going to have plenty of ideas about how to grow. Um, but a lot of times they're coming into an industry that they may be new in, or maybe they're coming into a geography that they're really not that familiar with, or maybe they're not familiar with your customers. So for you to have a, uh, even, even though your ultimate goal may be an exit and you may not want to be involved in the business at all, 
thinking through what growth looks like, what are some avenues? Okay, is it that I'm in three states now, but there's an adjacent state that I could easily move into? They've got similar regulations. Some of my customers do work there and I could pick up another 5%, you know, market share if I did that. Or maybe there's another product I could move into. Or maybe, hey, if I hired two more salespeople and I put them in this particular territory, it could really do X, Y, and Z to sales. Thinking through those things and being able to present those to a buyer to say, hey, I've thought through what growth looks like. Uh, and I think if you were to come on board, if you were to invest in this company, there again, even if you're planning on exiting, they love hearing that story. They love hearing that growth uh, vision for the future from the owner, from the person who's already had success, who's been driving the company for years. If you've got those kind of things already thought out and laid out, even if you're not going to ultimately be the one to execute them because you're selling the company, a buyer's really, really going to like that because it helps them get a jump start on what they're already going to try to do, which is put that growth plan together. You're on the you're on the ground in your area with your customers' product services. You already know what works and what doesn't work a lot of times. So having that directly from you goes a long way uh, for the buyer. Oh, we've covered a ton of material today. The replay is going to be sent out as well in case you want to review this. But here's a question for you. We're going to do a poll on this in just a second when it comes to the market assessment. And Brett, I did actually see your question about uh, whether or not we do market assessments for CRI clients. We do, and really for anyone who is interested. So here's the poll question. Would you be more interested in a standard market assessment? And that means you're going to get a one page like this and also a financial exhibit. They're going to recast your financials as a buyer would look at them. And it's going to give you a very definitive and a very tight number of value for your, your business when it comes to the market assessment or the premium. And the premium, what this focuses on is not only the standard, but it adds in the Q of V, the quality of earnings, a very deep look at your financials to get you into that defendable position. And this is something that Mark Berry and other TAS members uh, would be involved in. And both of these are going to be quoted according to where you are. We have to look at your company and what this would entail. So the standard will have a lesser fee than the premium, but each one of these are quoted and customized for you. So if you're interested in these, just select standard. If you would prefer a look at that, uh, click uh, premium. If you prefer to do that, but we'll end up sending out information most likely on both of those, but just wanted to be able to see what the interest level was on each of these. So when it comes to uh, focusing on your business, when it comes to being able to get the maximum value, if you've got any questions, just type those in. We're coming to the end of our time and actually we're really at the end of the hour. So if you have anything, type that in relatively quickly and we will follow up and we will share that uh, information with you personally answering your questions and getting back with you. And then also here's all of our contact information. There's Mark, Brandon, myself, and Joel Sykes. Feel free just to reach out. Any questions that you have, and no question is silly or dumb, this is our work. This is what we do every day, all day. And if there are certain terms that we use that we're not clear uh, feel free to email and say, I didn't really understand this piece. Or here's the situation that I'm in within my company. Is this something that I really need to be focused on? Don't hesitate at all with any of your questions. And when it comes time to sell your business, uh, our team here at CRI Capital Advisors, that's what we do as well. We don't just do market assessments. We take companies to market, represent them start to finish, or Maybe somebody's knocking on your door right now and they're trying to make you an offer and you need somebody to stand in that gap and say, wait a minute, first of all, this number's wrong and this structure is really off. We can represent you even if you've got a buyer that's already there with you. But thank you so much for taking the time today. Thank you for uh, listening. Thank you for those of you who are asking questions. We're going to get back to you with that. And we know your time is precious and we know that you are looking to make your business even more valuable. We're more than happy to help you determine that value and we can't wait to represent you when you go to market to sell it for maximum value or for your next stage of business. Thank you everyone for coming out today.